Our text today is read from the first general letter of St. John the Apostle to the church, beginning with verse 1 of chapter 2. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old commandment which ye had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which ye have heard from the beginning. And again a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He that saith that he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. St. John has said that the first thing we need to understand about that eternal life, which was revealed to us by Jesus Christ and is now being revealed by the Apostle, is this, that in God there is only light and there is no darkness at all. God, through Jesus Christ, has made a provision for us to walk in fellowship with him and to be continually cleansed from the, the defilements of the way so that we can be always in the light and never in the darkness, cleansed from our sins, kept clean and pure, so that we have that fellowship with God and with the saints. And now St. John has said that we can't get by by claiming that we haven't sinned or that we don't sin. That's just simply not true. And we use the illustration of the man coming in from the field who acknowledges that he has got the dirt from the day and from the field on him, and so he goes right straight in and he gets in the shower and he washes and makes himself clean. And in this way, he maintains his purity and his cleanliness. If he tried to ignore that, if he was lazy concerning his habits, if he went in without washing, if he went, sat down and ate his supper and went to bed without cleaning up and went out the next day and did the same thing, he would soon become a filthy and defiled man with the, with the filth of many days built up upon him. And this then becomes a contemptible and an undesirable thing. The same thing is true with the children of God who do not attend to their lives by walking in the light and in fellowship with God and constantly coming to God daily to be washed from the defilement of the way. This is one of the humbling realities that we have to acknowledge. That even though we are in Christ, even though we have been born into the family of God, even though we have been given the Holy Ghost, we still 
defile ourselves in the way. In getting out and putting yourself on the line for Christ in this world, you get defiled by the paths in which we walk. And Jesus told St. Peter, he said, you're clean, but not all. The only thing you need to do in order to maintain your part and your fellowship with me is to daily wash your feet. And Jesus didn't intend to start a ceremony by that any more than he intended that that the baptism or the Lord's Supper or any of these other things should become religious rituals. They're speaking of practical realities. We need to acknowledge in one another that we have faults, we have failures, we need to beseech the Lord on their behalf, we need to be forgiving, and we ourselves need to come to Christ again and again daily to be cleansed, to be washed, to be kept pure. And we do that if we walk in the light of the truth of the Word of God, which is revealed to us by the Holy Ghost from this inerrant record, which has been left to us. And so St. John begins this the second chapter of this letter by saying, My little children, I have written these things unto you so that you don't sin. I've written to you so that you will walk in the light and be clean. But if any man sins, I want you to know this, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. We have an advocate this word advocate is the Greek word parakletos, and it means an intercessor, a counselor, a helper, a com comforter. It's like a man going in before the judge, and he has a lawyer, he has an advocate who knows his way around the court and can speak on our behalf. And the judge will accept the propitiation or the advocacy that is made by this man. If we sin, we have someone to go with us before the Father who can plead our case. And this one is Jesus Christ, the righteous. You say, well, yeah, but I could go into court and I could have the best lawyer in the world and I wouldn't get off because even though the lawyer might be well known at the court and he might be very able, he couldn't get me off from my crime. But but the apostle goes on to say this, and he is the propitiation, the propitiation for our sins. And this is the Greek word hilasmas, and it means an atoning victim. That's what it means. And it goes back in its imagery, another meaning of it is a mercy seat or a place of sitting down with God and obtaining mercy. And it harks back to the tabernacle in the wilderness and the mercy seat, which was made in the holiest of all, the lid which was put upon the Ark of the Covenant. This lid was made out of desert acacia wood, and it was overlaid with gold, and it had cherubims with wings on either side, wings reaching down toward the mercy seat and reaching up toward God. And on that mercy seat, between the wings of the cherubim, was put the blood of the atonement each year. And that tabernacle in the wilderness was a place of meeting between God and man. And God would meet with man. He would fellowship with man because of the holiest of all, because of the tent of meeting, because of the mercy seat and the blood that was put upon it. Now, you see, this was uh, something that was prophetic of Jesus Christ and his coming. The, the common denominator that you and I have before God is Jesus Christ, his son. And he is a, an atoning victim. Jesus Christ, the righteous. We're talking about righteousness here. We're talking about a judge. We're talking about a court. We're talking about judicial punishment. And we're saying that this advocate who goes before the Father with us has made an atonement for our crime. And God will meet with us, and our fellowship with him will be maintained on the basis of that atonement which Jesus Christ made 
for Jesus Christ himself being the atoning victim. Now in the mercy seat, the wings reach down to the altar to shut out all else so that only that mercy seat could be looked upon. And the wings reached up to God so that only the face of God could be seen, shutting out everything else except Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for sins. And upon the basis of that mercy seat and the blood of the atonement being put upon it, God was willing to meet together with man. This was typifying the fact that Jesus Christ is the basis of our fellowship with God. And if we sin, we can go into the presence of God with Jesus Christ who has made the atonement for our sin and we can have our fellowship maintained. We can have our guilt cleansed and our purity restored. And you have to look at this now. We're talking about sanctification, and I warn you, and I caution you, and I call upon you to look at this in terms of the daily maintenance of our purity before God. If we want to walk with God, if we want to be in fellowship with God, we can be that by obeying God's word, by confessing our faults daily, by never letting anything build up on you, don't go to bed without clearing the record. God will forgive. He is faithful and he is just to forgive us and cleanse us if our heart is in the right place. Our desire is to walk with him if we are humble and realistic about our faults. This is how we maintain fellowship with God. And that's why the Bible says, A haughty spirit God despises, but a broken and a contrite heart the Lord loves. Not that God wants to put us down or keep us feeling low about ourselves, but he wants to see us live in the real world, continue through Christ and by the Spirit of God to walk that path of righteousness. And we're talking about sanctification, not about justification. We're talking about our lives, our usefulness, our service, to confess and to know that there is forgiveness. God's willingness to forgive you is not based on the story that you can put up. It's not based on the pretense that you can make. It's not based on your arguments or your excuses. God's willingness to forgive is based upon Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross. He is our mercy seat. He is our atoning victim. He is the basis of upon which God and man can meet together. He is the propitiation for our sins. And he said, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. We're not attempting to say that the death of Jesus Christ has meaning only with respect to the Christian in his daily walk and his need for daily cleansing. The death of Christ also has meaning for those in the world without to justify them to bring them to Christ and to cause them to be born into the family of God. The propitiation that Jesus Christ made is for all sin of all men, whatever the consequence or concept of all time, everywhere. And listen to this, it's a good thing too because all of us, justified or not, need that constant forgiveness and cleansing. And you need to understand that, otherwise you will become a Pharisee, your sins will bring you guilt. They'll drive you underground. They'll cause you to try to pre pretend that you're not that way. And you'll make excuses. And it will be, you'll have all these little rules where if you do this, it's all right. If you do that, it's not all right. And it'll come out that whatever I do is okay, but whatever the other guy does and isn't and so on. And it leads to an unrealistic and defeated kind of a life. There's only one thing to do about your faults and that's bring them to Christ daily and admit them and get rid of them. I'm dealing with Christian people all the time who've been fighting with the same problems for years and they're beating them and beating them and crushing them and pushing them around and causing them to feel guilty and to feel unhappy and sad and morose. And the reason is very simple. They won't admit they're wrong. They won't admit it. It's the other guy. It's not me. You just don't listen. You just don't pay attention to what I say. You never let me get my argument made. They won't admit it. 
And if you won't admit it, you can't do anything about it. And you're not fooling anybody but yourself. You can't get rid of your sins if you won't admit it. We have to learn to acknowledge what we've done and to forgive ourselves because God forgives us when we confess and turn to him with an honest desire to have our Christian walk with him maintained. That's such an important concept for Christian people to get clear in their minds. And St. John said, this is the way that we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If we keep his commandments. You say, wait a minute, now wait a minute. I thought the commandments were gone. I thought we were under grace. I thought the commandments were all part of the old law and were taken away. And I didn't think that knowing God had anything to do with keeping of God's commandments. Well, if that's your thought and that's your reaction, I can tell you that you have made at least two basic theological errors. You made at least two errors. The first is that grace does not take away the commandments. Grace does not take away the commandments. Jesus said, don't think that I came to destroy the law. I did not come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill it. And I want to tell you that as long as this earth stands, until heaven and earth passes away, not one period or one punctuation mark will ever pass from the law of God until all be fulfilled. You're confusing the covenant of the law with the law of God. The covenant of the law is gone. No longer does man in any sense try to commend himself to God by his own efforts, through his own moral goodness, by earning favor. That was the condition in the covenant of the law, which is gone because by the deeds of the covenant of the law shall no flesh be justified. But the law of God, the moral law, the law that stands for God's righteousness has never passed away and never will. And no writer of the Bible ever intended to say that. St. Paul writing to the Romans in that great declaration of the grace of God, the most basic book in all the Bible, asked the question at the end of that marvelous third chapter, after he had said a man is justified without the deeds of the law, he said, what, what, what are we saying then? That we make God's law void? He said, God forbid, we don't do that. We fulfill the law of God. We need to understand the difference between God's law and the old or the law covenant. The law covenant, which proposed that we earn righteousness through our own moral and religious goodness, is gone and fortunate for us. But the law of God, which stands for God's righteousness, has never passed, and that is also fortunate for us. And then another mistake, another basic theological error that you have made, if that is your reaction, is this. You don't understand the difference between the issues of justification and sanctification. And I believe that this is the greatest confusion in Christendom today. I really believe it is. I think that because good expository Bible teaching has all but disappeared from the church in the modern times, People are not versed on these most important issues of the Bible. Sanctification is talking to Christian people about setting their lives apart unto service for God. In justification, righteousness has already come to us when we repent and are converted. But in sanctification, righteousness comes to us daily as we deny ourselves and die to ourselves and live unto God. The issue of righteousness as it applies to sanctification is our life each day, whether we're going to save it, whether it's going to count for God, whether it's going to mean anything. This is a salvation. This is a deliverance. 
the one which the New Testament speaks the most about. It's a different issue than the issue of justification or being tried and found innocent in the sight of God when we make that basic repentance and acknowledge that we are lost and in sin and apart from God and there isn't anything we can do about it and we turn to God for mercy to be forgiven and to be born into his family. It's just as different an issue as it is in the human family when we talk about a child being born on the one hand and becoming a child of his parents and talking about his physical, moral, emotional, educational, spiritual growth on the other hand and what kind of a child he's going to grow up to be. We're talking about what kind of children in the family of God we are going to grow up to be. God's law has never been taken away and it is absolutely essential for you and I if we are going to make our mark for the Lord to understand this that grace has come to take away sin and to give us righteousness the Holy Ghost has come into our lives to help us live righteous lives and that is all one and the same with keeping the commandments of God and St. John said we know that we know him and we are in fellowship with him and we are walking in the light when we keep his commandments this is why we keep saying that the Word of God is so important because that's where God's will is revealed. It's not revealed in modern existential religion. It's not revealed in situation ethics or new morality or what the new sexual and social mores are in modern would-be fundamental religion. God's will and, and truth is not revealed in the fact that everybody's doing it these days so it's all right. It's revealed in the Word of God. We know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. And St. John said, i got to tell you something else, and you might as well know it. I know it's a little harsh. I know it's a little hard, but you're never going to know the truth any other way than if you hear this. If you say, I know Him, and you don't keep His commandments, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. I don't care how religious you are. I don't care how much you pray. I don't care how much you talk about being right with God. If you're a rebel and you're holding out against the revealed will of God, and I don't care what that is, whether it's your attitude toward leaders, your attitude toward your employer, your attitude toward your wife or your husband or your mother or your father, if you don't do what the Bible says to do, don't go around claiming that you know God because you're a liar. You don't know Him. You do not know Him. Not in the sense of sanctification. You are not walking in the light if you don't keep the commandments of God. No, you're not. No, you're not. You say, well, my church, I don't care about your church. I'm talking about the Bible, the Word of God. You know what it says. You can read. And these things are simple. They're not complicated. And if you don't keep the commandments of God and you say you know Him, you're lying. You're lying. John says it. He that saith, I know Him and keepeth not His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. He's not walking in the light. He's not living his life in the light. He's not coming to God daily and confessing his sins and being cleansed and staying on the path and walking in the light and walking in the light of truth. He's fighting that same bitter, stubborn, self-righteous, religious, pharisaical old battle that he's been fighting all along. I'm right and I know I'm right. I'm going to put my foot down. You're not going to tell me. Nobody's going to make me give up. Go ahead. Do it all you want, but don't lie to yourself and don't lie to others. You're in the dark. You're in the dark. You're in the dark. You're only in the light if you keep the commandments of God. And that's how you know that you're in the light if you keep His commandments. And this is how you know that you're in the dark and you're lying if you don't keep His commandments. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. We're talking about love in the sense of the word agape, 
moral, spiritual, ethical love, responsibility, duty. The love of God, the moral, ethical, spiritual responsibility that God requires of us is matured, it is developed. That's what the word perfected means. The word teleuo, and it means to finish, to accomplish, to consummate, to fulfill. It means completeness. That purpose which God has for our lives is completed if we keep his word. And in that way, we know that we are in him. Our lives are in him. We're walking in the light. We're in fellowship with him. We're doing his will. We're walking in his ways. We know that when we keep his word. Where's the light in